Good morning, Sardis. It is it's a delight to see you all this morning. And uh, as we start to celebrate the, the season and the time that we've had together with our families and eating some good food and giving thanks, I'm thankful for you all. I'm glad to see you. I'd like to invite you all to join with me and stand as we sing our opening song, which is Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Good morning, Sardis Church family. It is good to see everyone here this morning. I hope everyone had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving with family and friends if you were able to gather with them. And as you can see, uh, the Christmas season is upon us and the ladies and, and all those who helped decorate the church did an absolutely wonderful job. So let's give them a round of applause this morning. Well, if you are here this morning and you are a visitor here, we welcome you to our uh, church service. My name is Michael Kimberly, and I have the pleasure of being the pastor here at Sardis. And as you walked in, I hope that you received uh, a bulletin when you came in. And if you did, you will notice in that bulletin there's a little tear-off on the side where we ask that our visitors just jot down a little bit of information about yourself. We promise uh, we won't uh, blow up your emails or visit you unannounced, but we do just want to record uh, your presence with us, and we do appreciate you being here this morning. 
And if you'll take that form and on your way out, you'll see some offering plates there uh, by the doors on your way out. If you'll just drop that form into the offering plate uh, on your way out. Uh, the only offering we ask our guests to make is that of yourself and letting us know that you were here. Or if you would allow me the privilege of coming to visit with you in your home, instead of dropping that form in the offering plate, if you would hand that to me uh, at the end of the service, we'll call and set up a time uh, at your convenience uh, to, uh, to come visit with you. I would consider that an honor. And so we welcome you here this morning. And so would you join with me in praying uh, God's blessing upon our service this morning. Our Father, we do thank you again for another opportunity to gather as your church, as your people, Lord, to gather together to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father. And I do pray that that is uh, the reason we're here this morning. Father, is to focus upon you, to lift our praises to you, Father, to glorify you, Father, for you are worthy of it all. And God, we do pray today as we come and as we set under the preaching of your word, God, I do pray that you would speak to us uh, this morning through your word. God, I pray for those who may be here this morning, Father, who have never trusted Christ, that today would be the day, Lord, that you remove the veil uh, from their eyes, Lord, that you give them ears to hear, Father, that you give them uh, a heart to receive, Father, your word, Lord, that you would convict them of their sin and show them very clearly the hope that we have in Christ. And Father, I do pray today that in all things, Lord, that your people would be encouraged, edified, convicted, and encouraged, and that, God, you would be made much of. For that is why we're here. That is why we exist. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us and for loving us first. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. And before we continue with our service, every year, this time of the year, Southern Baptist churches, uh, all 46,000 of them are thereabouts, gather together or join together to take up an offering. And the offering is called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. And this offering we will be taking all throughout the month of December. And 100% of those proceeds go to our international missionaries who are out on the field. And so we got a short little video we want you to watch, and then at the end of the service, Pastor Rich will have a little bit more to say about that offering. So watch the video. For many weeks, our churches have been unable to have physical gatherings. But by God's mercy, the Church of Jesus Christ continues. The Southern Baptist Convention continues. For 175 years, we have pressed forward together through wars, disasters, plagues, economic downturns, and political upheavals. Our effort of proclaiming Christ around the world has never stopped. Your support, your prayers, your gifts, all of us working together as the body of Christ have kept our missionaries on the field over the decades and keeps them there now. God is at work around the world in the most amazing ways and he is using you, your family, and your church to help your missionaries, our missionaries, as they move forward with the gospel. The Derbyshires partner with churches in the United States to lead mobile clinics all over Thailand, using medicine as a means to share the gospel with those who have no other access. Christ is proclaimed. 
disciples are made and churches are planted. In Kenya, IMB missionary Kristen Lowry believes the very best place for a child is in a family. That is why she is working alongside National Kenyan Partners to rescue boys living on the streets, restore their lives, provide shelter, a trade, physical and spiritual nourishment, and reunite them with their families. The Worthy family has recognized the importance of investing in relationships and in Italian culture, which is why they have planted their lives in Italy for the past 17 years. College students have dropped the term hard places from their vocabulary and are responding to go anywhere in the world where people don't have access to the gospel. We treasure Jesus and his gospel above all. But let us remember, we are not called to hoard the gospel, but to herald it far and wide. We are not called to stockpile the gospel, but to send it forth to those yet in darkness that they may see the light of Jesus Christ and live. Amen. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to be making your way to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 is where we are going to be this morning. And uh, as we begin a new series for Christmas, series entitled, The Word Became Flesh, and in a message I've entitled today, Isaiah's Gospel Hope. In Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at the first seven verses of this passage of Scripture. Isaiah 9, beginning in verse 1, and God's Word says this, But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Our Father, again, we thank you for allowing us this time to gather together to sit under the preaching and the teaching of your word. Lord, I do pray that today that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. For it's in my rock and my redeemer, in Jesus' blessed name, I offer this prayer. Amen. Well, here we are again, another Christmas season is upon us, and I think it is fair to say that this Christmas season uh, is coming at us at a time that's uh, somewhat unique, I think, in, in the life of our nation. You know, I think it's also fair to say that people, when we get to this time of year, and they approach this time of year, they approach it with different emotions, different levels of excitement. Or anticipation, and maybe that is a direct result to whatever age you might, you might be. Uh, ten, 
the younger tend to be a little more anxious and excited and anticipate it, although I do know of some older folks that are uh, that way as well. But many people approach this time of year with varying degrees of emotions, some even with varying degrees of hopefulness, and sadly some uh, with varying degrees of hopelessness. I would say for many, this is going to be probably the hardest Christmas they've ever had because they will face this Christmas without a loved one. This will be the first time. I know people here in our own church, this will be the first Christmas that they will face without a loved one that they've always had with them. It will be very, very difficult uh, for them. And so there's a lot of emotions that get wrapped up in this time of year and we approach again this Christmas season with a world that, quite honestly, uh, is in, I would say, great confusion, to put it mildly. Uh, Maybe some great turmoil that is going on in our world. We can look around our world and we can see that there is a moral revolution that is taking place in our world that is changing the way in which people see this world, that has, quite honestly, thrown common sense and Uh, basic biology just right out the window in many cases. You know, we come to this time of year and we're facing a world where racial tensions are at a, a, a a fever pitch and it affects the way in which we see one another and the way in which we communicate with one another. Now, it is true that a lot of that is just stirred up uh, in the media uh, for people who profit off of our division, but nonetheless, it's there. And we have to live with it and deal with it. Then, of course, there's all the political chaos that is going on in our world, the likes of which, at least in the time I've been paying attention to it, the likes of which I've I've never seen. And so there's wars, and then there's riots, and there's all kind of things, not just here in our country, but in places all across this world. I saw something last night about riots uh, over in France that are going on right now as we speak. And so we enter into this Christmas season in a world that is a little bit uh, confused, a little bit of turmoil. And all of this that we see going on, I think, is evidence for us that this world is becoming a much different place than it used to be. Now, there are, of course, good things that are going on in this world. So I don't want to you know, paint a completely negative picture. However, I think if we're honest, what we're seeing is a trend, and the trend seems to be going down. And so people, as I look out into this world, and as I was thinking about this, and I couldn't help but think about how the people were in the time of the judges over in the Old Testament book of Judges. It seems that most folks, or more people than not, have turned to their own way and doing what seems right in their own eyes and they have abandoned really any aspect of righteousness or holiness or moral clarity at all. And so we enter into this Christmas season with a world that is much different than it was, say, even 10 years ago. Never mind 20 or 30 years ago. And so as I was thinking about that, I thought, man, what is this world going to look like in the next 10 years if things keep changing at the pace in which they're changing now? What is this world going to look like in the next 10 years? Or the next 20? And uh, so we come to Christmas. Another Christmas season. A time of year where things are supposed to be hopeful. <laughs> a time of year that is supposed to bring hope to us, and yet we look out at this world and we see everything that is going on, and in light of all that we see happening, we have to ask ourselves the question, well, what hope does Christmas bring? What hope does it actually bring to us? Well, I'm glad you asked the question, because this morning I want to spend some time simply trying to answer that question, at least uh, in part, and try to give Uh, some answer to the question of what hope we have. What does the future actually 
hold for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we're asking about what hope do we have by way of context, that would have been the exact question that the people in Isaiah's day would have been asking uh, during their time on earth. See, the world today is a mess, no doubt. But guess what? It was a mess in Isaiah's day as well. It was just as much a mess in, his, uh, in Isaiah's day. Isaiah spoke into a world, and he spoke into a time that was full of moral and social and political and spiritual decay. At this point in uh, Israel's history, the nation of Israel was in a time of great confusion, of great turmoil. The hearts of the people had turned their backs. They had turned their backs on God, and the hearts of the people were far from God. Now, they still played around with their religion, right? Like a lot of people do today. They still played the game, and they checked some of the boxes, but make no mistake about it. The hearts of the people were far, far from God. Uh, their leaders, their uh, political leaders and, and other leaders were corrupt, as was evidenced by the social decay that was going on in the nation. And quite honestly, it was a time when the people wondered uh, if they were even going to survive. They didn't even know what the future could possibly hold for them. And were the promises of God actually true? And if they were true, was God going to honor His promises? Was God going to keep His promises? And so Isaiah spoke into a world that is very much uh, like the world in which we now live in. A world that is soaked in darkness, confusion, and quite a bit of turmoil. At this point in, in uh, Israel's history, the nation had been divided into two kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom, which retained the name Israel. You have the southern kingdom, which was Judah. You had the Assyrians, who were the enemies of Israel. They were on the rise again, and they were on the march. And war was once again on the horizon for the people. If you read through Isaiah chapter 8, you can see that the people, again, had turned their back on God and uncertain of where to turn at this point in their lives, they sought guidance in all the wrong places, including false gods and including trying to conjure up uh, the dead. And they even sought guidance and salvation from their corrupt political leaders. Can you imagine that? Yeah, you probably can imagine that. And so it was a time of great confusion and overwhelmed by the darkness, the people looked to anyone and looked to anything for light and hope. And so, yes, these were very dark and difficult days that the prophet of God spoke the word of God to the people of God. And I'm not sure there's a better picture uh, of where we find ourselves today. Uh, the the similarities to where they were and to where we are are quite stark. But Isaiah had a word of hope for them. And Isaiah had reminded them, and he reminded those that, that if they would remain faithful, that if they would hold on to the word of God, if they would guard it, if they obeyed it, and if they believed it, then there was hope in spite of. In spite of all the darkness and all the confusion that they were living in. He says in chapter 8 and verse 17, he says, Isaiah says this, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And he says, I will hope in him. He says, I'm going to wait on the Lord even though the Lord right now is silent. Even though he is not speaking. Even though he has turned his face from us. He says, I'm going to hope. In him. Now, the him, obviously, that he is referring to is the Lord, but the him he is also talking about is the person we see mentioned in chapter 9 and verse 6. You see, God's answer to all the chaos, God's answer to all the gloom and all the darkness and to everything that upset the people of God, his answer to all of that was going to be a child that was going to be born. You see, God's answer to where hope is found is seen 
and a son that is going to be given. A child that is born and a son that is going to be given. And I can't explain to you how that was the greatest news that they could have ever heard. And dear friends, I would submit to you it is still the greatest news that we can hear uh, today. Let's go back to verse 6. Notice what the text says. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And like I said, those very words were spoken in a time of deep darkness for God's people. A time where the people were utterly corrupt and completely hopeless and helpless and unfaithful. And it was into that situation that God gave Isaiah words of hope in spite of their unfaithfulness. Man, what grace. What a God of grace that we serve. Into that situation. He gave Isaiah words of hope to speak to the people. And just so you're kind of clear on the situation that the people were in, if you look at the last verse of chapter 8, verse 22, it really kind of gives us a summation of their situation. And it says this, And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. See, that was the reality. That was the reality, and God gave Isaiah words of hope to speak into that darkness, to speak into that chaos, to speak into that anguish. And this wasn't the first time that God had given words of hope in dark times. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, we see God mentioning this child uh, again. And this time he says that there's going to be a baby. And that baby's going to be born. And that baby's name is going to be called what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That is God with us. And then we come over to chapter 9 and verse 6. And we see this child mentioned again. But this time he's God with us in chapter 7. And in chapter 9 he's God for us. In chapter 9. Now why is he God for us? Well we see this gloom, and we see this darkness here at the end of chapter 8, then everything changes on a dime when we get to chapter 9. Everything reverses at an instant in chapter 9. And he says at the end of chapter 8, he says there's gloom and there's anguish and there's all these things. And then we come to verse 1 of chapter 9, and what does he say? But there is no gloom. There will be no gloom. So in chapter 9, we find a picture of hope. And this picture of hope consists of the arrival of a new David. It consists of the arrival of a new king, but not just any king, but the king of kings. He's coming, Isaiah's telling them. In chapter 9, we find a bright word of gospel hope and a promise of a child that is going to be born and a son that is going to be given. And see, we have the luxury of being New Testament people, New Covenant people, and we live on this side of the cross, and we know who that child is. We know who that son is, and that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to chapter 9, and we see Isaiah telling the people that there's coming this glorious reversal, right? There's coming this glorious reversal, and it's like he's saying, listen, I know things seem dark now. I know things seem really hard right now. I know the situation in your life may seem hopeless, but he's saying, hold on, because God's not finished, right? God is still at work. And I would say to each one of us, as we look out into this crazy and chaotic world, friend, don't despair. God's not finished. He's not done. He's made promises. And he's going to keep those promises. Do not forget, he is not only God with us, but he is God very much for us. And he has made promises, and he is going to keep those promises. And Isaiah tells them that things are going to change. That these things are going to change with the coming of this child, with the coming of this son. Things are going to look different. Well, how different? What's it going to look like for them? 
Well, we see in the first five verses of chapter 9 this glorious reversal that takes place. Notice what they say. He tells them in verse 1. He said that there's coming a day where the gloom and the anguish will be reversed. In in verse 2, he says darkness will be be replaced with light. In verse 3, he says joy will be multiplied. In verse 4, he says burdens will be lifted and victories will be won. And in verse 5, he says wars will cease. That's good news. And all of this is going to happen because a child is going to be born. And a son is going to be given. And see, here's the beauty of it. Again, this side of the cross. New covenant people, we have uh, a little better perspective. Part one of that has already happened, hasn't it? Part one has already happened. This wonderful truth that uh, Isaiah prophesied about is actually going to take place. And some of it has already taken place. We know it if you go over... In the New Testament to Luke's Gospel in chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2 verses uh, 8 through 14 we see this this glorious uh, church service that takes place one night. And I love this passage of scripture and I'll just read it to you. And it says, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were, I love how the old King James says, and they were sore afraid right they were terrified and the angel said unto them fear not for behold i bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of david a savior who is christ the lord and this will be a sign for you and you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger and i love this part and suddenly There was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Glorious church service. The baby was born. What Isaiah prophesied, what Isaiah said would happen, what God promised would happen, dear friends, happened. Just as he said It would, and hope came into the world. And now, as Israel, the nation Israel, still hopes for the physical manifestation of all these promises, dear friend, you and I who are here today and are in Christ, who are saved and who are redeemed, we have already experienced this hope, at least in part. At least in part. Here's what I mean. Right now, you and I, live in a world where there's a little bit of tension, right? We live in a little bit of tension, as theologians call, we, theologians call it the already and the not yet, right? We live in the tension between the already and the not yet, and here's what they mean by that. By that, they mean that the kingdom of God has already come. It came with Christ. We see that in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. And right now, if you're in Christ, right now you currently enjoy some of the blessings that come uh, with the kingdom. However, while we enjoy the kingdom in part, it has not come in full. We see that in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. So here's the reality. It's already come, but it hasn't come completely. I love what George Ladd, how he puts it when he talks about this tension between the already and the not yet. He says it describes it as fulfillment without consummation. Fulfillment in his first coming and consummation in his second coming. Kingdom blessings can be experienced today. However, many of them are reserved and will not be experienced until Christ returns. End quote. And so right now, we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we live with a little bit of tension, right? Between the already and the not yet. And you see, and because of Christmas, because this child was born, and because He saved us today, if you're in Christ, you can have hope today. You can have hope today. And if you're not, in Christ. And if you are here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, dear friend, hope 
is available to you. If you will but bend the knee and submit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what did Christ accomplish for us with His life and His death and His glorious resurrection? What are some of the uh, already benefits that we enjoy today as believers in Christ? Well, go back to verses 1 through 5 of chapter 9. And we see what has been accomplished for us in Christ. Verse 1, our gloom and our anguish has been replaced with the promise of something better. The deep darkness that we used to walk around in has been replaced with the light of Christ. We see that in verse 2. Verse 3, our sadness has been replaced with joy. Verse 4, the burden of our great oppressor, which is sin, has been lifted off of us and has been the victory over that oppressor has been won for us through Christ. In verse 5, the war that raged within. The war that led to separation between us and God. The war that allowed for the wrath of God to abide upon us. That war for us who are in Christ is eternally over and it has been eternally won. And now we have peace. Not only the peace of God, dear friends, but we have peace with God. All because of what Christ has done for us. And all of that was accomplished because a child was born and because a son was given. And for those of us in Christ, that is our current reality. That is what we enjoy right now. That is our already hope. So that's the already. But what about the not yet? What's still to come? What do we have to look forward to? When we come to this Christmas season, we can rejoice in what we have already, but, but what else do we have uh, to look forward to? I'm glad, again, you asked. I mean, this world, right, is still a mess. We can all agree. I hope that that's true. This world is still a mess, so what hope do we have for the future? Well, I want to point you again back to verse 6. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Then go down to verse 7. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. You see, this child that was born, this son that was given, he would come and he would live a perfect life and he would die a substitutionary death on the cross to save his people from their sins and he would satisfy not only the justice of God but he would satisfy the very wrath of God and this son came and he accomplished all of that for his people but dear friend make no mistake about it this son is coming again but this time when he comes he will not come as suffering servant he will come as ruling reigning and sovereign king and not just king but king of kings now that's good news and it should get you excited if that doesn't get you excited friend your woods wet this morning and i don't know what to do with you but that is good news for every one of us who are in christ here's the hope that we have right now in the here and now but here's the deal we still have corrupt leaders we still have sin we still have war we still have division we still have all this stuff we have to deal with but friend listen to me there's coming a day when our true king our righteous king our perfect king is going to come and he's going to come with his kingdom and his kingdom will be upon his shoulders and he will rule in perfection and with peace forever forevermore and that is good news for us this morning he will be the answer jesus christ will be the answer to our pursuit of this perfect and lasting kingdom that all of us, I believe, in this room desire and want so bad. You know, if you want to see what this pursuit looks like without Christ, friend, flip on the television, turn on the news, and you'll see what man-made pursuits look like. But Christ promises something better. 
praise God, there's coming a day when there will be no more nightly news stories of corruption and scandal. And there will be no more riots. And there will be no more division. And there will be no more self-serving people trying to acquire power just to enrich themselves. And praise God and hold hold your seat. There will be no more Twitter. And I can't wait for the day that that happens. Cannot wait. Christ's reign and His rule will be perfect. And it will be complete. And He will establish His rule and His kingdom. And He will uphold it with perfect justice and perfect righteousness. And that's good, right? But it gets better. You're thinking, how can that possibly be better? Well, it gets better. Go back to verse 7. Go back to verse 7 and notice what it says. And of the increase of His government. And I want you to think kingdom. And of the increase of his government and of peace. What does it say? There will be no end. You see what he's saying? You see what Isaiah is saying here? There is no end to increase. And of his government and of peace, the increase of that will not end. So Isaiah is saying that this kingdom of grace, this kingdom of peace, He's saying it's going to forever expand. It's going to always get better. In other words, there's never going to be a time for those of us who are in Christ when we're in the kingdom of God and we're ruling and reigning with Christ. There's never going to be a time when we can look around and say, hey, this is as good as it gets. Why? Because there will not be a good as it gets. Because it's always getting better. There's always going to be more to see. Always more to learn. Always more to enjoy and always more to praise God for. We will live eternally and never come to the end of who our God is. There will never be a good as it gets. I love how one writer has put it. He said this. He said, there will never come one moment when we'll be able to say this is the limit. That he, talking about God, can't think of anything new. That we've seen it all. He said, there will never come a time when that's the case. He says the finite, that is us, will experience ever more wonderfully the infinite. And every new moment will be better than the last. Praise God for that. You know, I can't even get my mind around that. But yet there it is. (laughs) There it is. As Adrian Rogers used to say, that's black print on white paper. I mean, it's as plain as you can be. That's what awaits us that's the hope that we have and you see and we can go into this christmas season thankful for the hope we have in the here and now and praise god we can go into this christmas season thanking him for the bright hope that we have for tomorrow and so as we look around this world this crazy chaotic mixed up world dear friend if you're here today and you're a believer in the lord jesus christ do not despair do not despair we have hope for today and again we have a bright hope for tomorrow and this child that is going to be born that was born this son that was given is going to accomplish it all but how how is he going to accomplish it well he's going to accomplish it because of who he is and who is he he's God he's none other than God himself and those titles that you see there and I don't have time Uh, to get into all of them. But those titles that you see there in verse 6 explain not only who He is, but they explain how He will rule in His kingdom. Notice He says He is God. He is wonderful counselor. means He has divine wisdom. He is mighty God. That means He has divine power. He is everlasting Father. That means He has divine love and He is Prince of Peace. And that means... He is the, has divine peace. And all of that, He will bring with Him. And He will rule and He will reign in His kingdom with divine wisdom, divine power, divine knowledge, love, peace, and all the things that make Him God. And finally, the last question I just want to ask you, well, how do we know? How do we know This is actually going to happen. Well, look at the end of verse 7. End of verse 7, we find the answer to how we can know. Notice what it says. 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The same zeal that sent Jesus Christ to the cross will be the same zeal that will one day send him back to set up his kingdom. And how many of you know, when you have an omnipotent and all-powerful, sovereign creator God who's zealous to make something happen, how many of you know it's going to happen? Just like he says, it will. You see, the zeal and the passion of the Lord is what's driving history towards the final victory of grace and of His mercy, and of His love. His rule will be, again, with divine wisdom and power and divine love. And He will bring once and for all that thing I think all of us want so much, and that is that perfect peace. You see, this is the hope that we have right now as we live in the tension between the already and the not yet. And so as we enter into this Christmas season, this is the hope that Christmas brings. The hope of today that we have in Christ and the hope that we have for what is to come. And friend, I would say this to you as you consider this crazy world and all of its promises. Remember this. Remember this. This place is not your home. This kingdom on this earth is not your kingdom. And Trump is not your king. Jesus Christ is your king. And you belong to his kingdom. And that is the kingdom that we are to represent. That is where our hope is found, not here. Amen? Amen. All right, would you bow your heads and close your eyes. We come to a moment of of invitation. You know, one of the beauties of the Bible and one of the graces of God to us is that He has given us His Bible. But that contained in that Bible is a lot of promises just like we have looked at today. That God in His grace and in His mercy has not left us down here to wander It's not left us down here to have false hope, to hope in the things of this world that are fleeting. But we have promises that God has made, and God is going to keep those promises, each and every one. And so if you're here today, and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, church, I would encourage you to rest in those promises. To get in your Bible and see what God has said to you and about you and what He has planned for you. Let that be where your hope and where your faith resides. But friend, listen to me. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, you've never received Christ as Lord and Savior, you've never humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God, And friend, like I say all the time, these promises are not for you. But they can be. They can be. And I do not believe that God, uh, that you're here by accident, but I believe God has brought you here to us this morning. And for nothing else is to hear this, you can be saved. You can have your sins forgiven, if you will, but trust in Christ. And in a moment we're going to stand and we're going to have a Him of invitation. We're going to invite you to come. Walking this aisle does not save you. Saying some magic prayer does not save you. What saves you is that you repent of your sins and you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if that's you this morning, we invite you to come. There's others of you here who may be looking for a church home. We invite you to come and to learn more about what it means to be a church member here at Sardis the doors of this church are open and we invite you to come and make this your church home but if not here somewhere else dear friend you need to be in a Bible believing and a Bible teaching church especially in the days in which we find ourselves in today you need to be under the preaching of the word of God and if this is where God would have you to come and 
to plant yourself at this season of your life, we invite you to come. We'd love to talk to you more about that. But in all things, church, let us trust and let us find our hope and let us enter into this Christmas season uh, with the hope we have today and remembering the bright hope that we have for tomorrow. And Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace, God, in our life. We thank you for allowing us, Lord, to be here, to, to hear of what you have not only done for us, but God, but what you have planned for us. And Father, I pray today that if there be one here today who's never received Christ, that today would be the day, Lord, that you would draw them eternally to yourself and save them. And Father, in all things, we're going to be careful to give you the glory and the honor and the praise for you are worthy of it all. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Would you please stand to your feet? seated. Uh, this time we'd like to give you all a few brief announcements before you leave to let you know about some things coming up for the church this week. Uh, one of those being is that next week we do have a called business meeting following the morning worship service and we just encourage you to look at the copies of the budget for that uh, to be voted upon next week. Also next Sunday night, even though we've not been meeting here on Sunday nights, uh, next Sunday night the children's choir will be giving their program at 6, 30, uh, 6 p.m. 6 p.m and they would love for you to attend and support them in that. Also, the Angel Tree Mission Project, the due date for that to have the toys turned in uh, is gonna be next Sunday as well, so we encourage you to go in the back and make sure that you do your shopping this week and get those toys for those kiddos. Lastly, uh, earlier you saw the video for the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. Uh, Lottie Moon Christmas Offering contributes to missionaries all over the world, and I know it's been a very difficult year for our country, but it has for countries all over in places where there is pure darkness. There's no light of the gospel yet. But through your donations and contributions, it can be. And so we encourage you to take time this month to uh, prayerfully consider about uh, the Lord encouraging you to give, and that will be all month. And as you notice in your bulletin, there's a brochure. This is the Lottie Moon Week of Prayer. Take time this week to look over this brochure. Pray for the missionaries that are mentioned in this brochure, uh, for them and their families. Uh, lastly, there are envelopes for Lottie Moon uh, in the pews all month long that you can take and uh, donate that way. And we encourage you to do that. Uh, at this time, uh, we are going to dismiss for this week and we would encourage you to pray for one another. And since we've combined to one service now, we're going to ask that you have the left and right, uh, please leave first and then the center after them. Thank you very much, have a blessed week.